It's Comics Great Visual Storytelling Show recorded live every, well, no, every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library, lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the corner of 5th and William. Uh, this show is broadcast, uh, streamed live at comicsaregreat.tv and later collected as a podcast at comicsaregreat.com. My name is Jersey Drozd, cartoonist and teaching artist, and sitting to my right, is this stage right or stage left? I have no clue. I'm not a theater guy. <laughs> you see, you struck me as a theater guy. I never, never. I was, I was in one play in high school. That's it. Anyway, but <laughs> sitting, sitting next to jerseys, me, Paul Story, uh, comic book uh, writer and writer of other stuff as well. And um, we're going to talk about the Watchmen prequels. Oh, oh are no, we? No, Fun. We're not, no, that we're should not. be good. <laughs> There's been plenty of press on that. We do not need to go into that. And the, the Twitter stream on Monday was just ridiculous. Yes. And uh, you know what? I, I, I responded and reposted it, retweeted a couple things, and then I walked away from it because I was like, Twitter is not the place to discuss this. Mm. If, I, if I end up face-to-face -face with somebody to discuss something like that, like there's just too many nuances to be like, you know, 140 <laughs> characters. It's because it all boils down to, I like it, it sucks. Well, I think we can safely say that you are a Watchmen prequel apologist. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that was your stance on it. I, basically, anything that puts money into Dave Gibbons' pocket, I'm, I'm happy about. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I refrain from discussing it because you know, I, I really couldn't care any less about the subject. But uh, so, yeah, Paul. Couldn't um, you, Jersey? I could not. I could not. I mean, it was, Even though it's a creator's rights issue? Mm, there's better places to have that fight. Okay, there yeah. you go. So rather than, I, I, if we're going to have that fight, I'd rather not do it to benefit DC. Perhaps we should introduce our guest. I, I was going to get to that, but okay. I wanted to say, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> while, while we were on that big tangent, this is what we do. Uh, so, yes, Paul, we're going to play around with having you on the show every episode for a while. Yeah, see what people say, see what viewer demand. We'll do yes, like an American Viewer Idol. demand, get rid of him. <laughs> What the but, heck were you thinking? But this is all part of my plan. Uh, we've talked before about moving the show out into the fourth floor conference room where we can have a live studio audience, and at which point this will become more of a Conan O'Brien-ish show, which means I need an Andy Richter. Uh, not that I'm anywhere near as funny as Conan O'Brien, but I'm just as petulant. So, yeah. And no, nowhere near as tall. No, not even close, but I'm almost as pale. But anyway, so who, <laughs> who else <laughs> do we have in the room? Pale. You're not pale, you're red. <laughs> you're like a tomato. <laughs> That's because I'm excited about talking about comics. That's my Polish blood rushing to the service. But uh, let's talk about somebody who isn't quite so red, a little bit uh, better, easier on the eyes. Uh, Stephen, um, you know, I didn't ask how to pronounce your last name. McCraney. McCraney. That's what I thought, but I didn't want to butcher it. I it could have been McCranny. Could, well, no, they're, they're, but, I've heard so many versions. I, I, I get people who can't figure out how to pronounce story. And it's like, <laughs> I know it's spelled different. But really, how else could you call it? You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, there's two R's. I don't know what to do. But Stephen McCraney is the author of, oh, I can hold it up for the camera here. I can say Mal and Chad. And I got a copy of Food Fight in my hand right now, which is the one that's coming out in stores pretty soon. Is it this Yeah, one? it was out uh, about two and uh, three weeks ago, I think. Okay, Mal and Chad. So it should be in, in uh, your nearby Barnes & Noble and maybe some, some other local bookstores. And book soon to be in your new Amazon storefront. Uh, mm. that they're they're talking about putting up uh, actual physical stores now. What? Huh. Yeah. Huh? Oh, that would that would. Oh, take I'm I'm actually that. ahead of of Jersey on some bit of of uh, news, uh, internet news. Mm. Yeah, you spend some time on the Facebooks. So I'm sure you you catch <laughs> yeah. a few things every <laughs> now and again. So. Uh, but anyway, so Mal and Chad, we should tell introduce people for the, for those people who haven't heard of this book yet. Oh, you are at malandchad.com. Yeah. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit later about DoodleAlley.com, which is another neat thing that you do. Uh, and then uh, Stephen McCraney on the Twitters. Uh, but Mal and yeah. Chad, uh, this is a story of a young mad scientist. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty standard as far as the stories go. It's a young, um, kind of a boy and his dog kind of a story. And the boy is a, is a, uh, a boy genius who has all kinds of inventions. Um, and they go on adventures together, they're best of friends. The twist of the story is that Mal doesn't want anyone to know that he's a genius because he knows they'll take him they'll they'll take him out of his fourth grade class and put him into a college class. And uh, he has this crush on this on this girl that he really likes in his in his grade and he doesn't wanna um, be taken away from her. So he keeps it a secret, like kind of like a secret identity. Um, and that's just the basic premise. 
And Chad is the dog, which is a very unusual name for a dog, actually. That was the thing that caught me off guard is when I saw the title, Mal and Chad, I figured, okay, well, Mal's got to be the dog. Chad has got to yeah. be the boy. Now, see, whereas I, the thing that struck me was I assumed that Chad was going to be the mad scientist and Mal was, you know, his boy. But, he's, but, but Mal is wearing the robe. Oh, you got to But don't call it a robe. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually known as a... As a coat. Lab, yeah, lab, lab coat. coat. That, that's yeah. a running gag in the series. But yeah. we, we could show some of the artwork on, uh, people could go to malinchad.com uh, to see more. Would you, would you like me hold it open? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Vanna. Yeah. Uh, so you can see that this stuff is very clean, very crisp. Um, and uh, the storytelling is super, super sharp. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always a fan of that. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it is pretty good. Uh, I'm always a fan of any story that is aimed at children that doesn't talk down to children. And uh, I think mm. I think that you pulled that off with this story. Oh, I really appreciate that. I, I was actually having an interview with um, uh, a radio host the other about two weeks ago, and I was telling her about kind of my struggles and my insecurities and how Mal's insecurities kind of mirrors my own insecurities. And she asked me if I had grown out of them since I was a kid, and I was like, I don't think so. I I think there's less of a barrier between kids and adults than we'd like to admit sometimes. Um, I think there are different orders of magnitude with the with the type of problems they deal with, but I think they deal with very similar struggles that we do. I wish I could pull up, um, and I don't want to. I don't want to do it just for fear of like pausing the show. But uh, Greg Ruckar recently posted an interesting thing about writing Superman and writing characters who are uh, accessible to children, and the difference between writing gritty and writing sophisticated. And he said you can write stuff that's okay for kids that's sophisticated. It just means you have to be clearer, and then you have to have more vibrancy and more developed ideas in the story. And uh, there was somebody recently was posting on a blog, and it was one of these one of those things that just gets my uh, the hairs in the back of my neck standing up uh, with anger, is when they said like, oh, I'm having so much trouble writing this story. It's really tough, and I'm I'm struggling with all these themes. And why is this so hard? It's a kid's story after all. Oh yeah. <laughs> as, as if difficult themes and complex ideas have no business being in a kid's story because kids just don't get it. Now, one of the things that you cover in this book, Food Fight, and I, I'm not going to be spoiling anything for anybody, but uh, there's a lot of stuff about him wanting to be in a club and there's a there's a certain club and they're being very exclusive and he wants in and oh man if this isn't stuff that happens in your grown up life with people making their exclusive little niches and clicks all the stuff we're supposed to outgrow in high school that people carry into the office yeah. or carry into their social circles or, on, or carry into the comic book business oh my gosh yes yeah. so or carry into comic cons for that yes yeah and, and so it, it's it's yeah. go ahead sorry Steve. yeah that that whole um like one of the things I know is each each Mal and Chad story does seem to have kind of like a moral to it or some kind of message that just talks about those social issues. And I noticed that while as I'm writing it, I'm also kind of dealing with those issues. Like I especially you go to Comic Con and there's this real sense that there's these insiders and outsiders, and you want to be want someone on the inside. And uh, so it is directly kind of based off of that whole experience of seeing cartoonists that you really admire and they all seem to be hanging out and you want to be part of that circle and uh, it, it's something that I struggle with a lot and I had to almost read my own book to try to figure out like <laughs> it was like I was really processing through these these issues here and, and kind of speaking through uh, Mal as just as far as he really wants to get into a club he really wants to be a part of something he doesn't want to be an outsider and he, he does anything to try to get inside and so. another, another thing that I think is really lovely about how you constructed the story is that the harder he tries, the worse things get for him. So he tries to start his own club, and that quickly backfires when his own club members sort of form a coup and take over the thing without him even yeah. knowing it's happening. And then, and it's not until he stops trying so hard to be accepted and then just do the thing that he has to do that suddenly it's like, hey, you know, you really should be involved in this. And then I won't spoil what happens after that because there's this really lovely moment where... Mal has like sort of like a realization of like what these club things really ultimately an mean. epiphany an epiphany as it were yeah uh, but but you know it's like, you're right this is something that all us cartoonists deal with and and you hear in the hungry young beginning cartoonists it's like if I only just got so and so to blog me if I only just got to hang out with that group of people over there you know if I could just sit down for dinner with the flight crew when they when they're talking you know yeah. but, well the kind of the funny thing about that is though especially at comic cons usually you can yeah. <laughs> like I mean usually most people you know you know at the bigger cons it's a little harder cuz everybody's doing business and you know mm -hmm. whatever but 
most, almost everybody's approachable and sort of like you're saying, you know, once you stop trying so hard, yeah. it becomes a lot easier. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's one good thing about the industry is there, there, I find that there are a lot of people who are really approachable and the ones that aren't, you really don't want to spend time with all that much anyway. Yeah, but try telling, go ahead, Steven. My first Comic Con, um, which is about five years ago, uh, I was really in love with the flight crew and I wanted to, um, mm. make friends with them and, right. and, uh, just kind of be a part of it as best as I could. I'm sorry. And I didn't I, know I, I, I opened an old wound. That concept. What's that? I, I, I didn't realize that by using that example, I was opening an old wound. No, you hit, you hit it. You hit the perfect nerve. That's exactly how it, that was exactly kind of, if I was to pick a group, um, that I've really wanted to be a part of, it would definitely be that really incredible, uh, anthology that they, they put out together. Um, oh. Are you guys familiar with the term booth barnacle? Uh, it's I, someone I didn't know, but I, I think I probably, I, it was probably coined about me. Oh, yeah. It's someone at a convention who just stands at a booth and doesn't buy anything and just kind of doesn't do anything. And you try to get them off of your booth because they're just stuck there. And that was definitely me, my first convention there. I. I almost I almost feel silly about it now thinking back to it, but I just kind of planted myself there and tried to talk to whoever I could. And I, I, I only later had the realization it's very hard to make friends when there's a table in between you. And, yeah. uh, and you know, only after, like, um, developing relationships online and, and uh, kind of talking with them and having, like, kind of a more of a long-term relationship you, that, that, you know, you actually begin to form friendships and um, other things within the industry but I did not expect us to go there but that was a good little mini <laughs> talk on, on being social uh, in in the industry right uh, and, and then if, when all else fails go pick a fight about the Watchmen prequels right yeah. Paul that works yeah. well and and you know as you're saying uh, if if, uh, if people read Mal and Chad food fight they will then learn uh, you know through uh, through symbology, what uh, the way to to properly approach people? Yeah, kind of a, a heuristic symbology of uh, obsequious consequences. I'll just throw in a couple other <laughs> oh, words. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that didn't even make any sense. But. No, obsequious, <laughs> really? There, I just needed some multisyllabic words. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, so you know, or, like, or multisyllabic, whichever you want to choose. Yeah. Um, I, I was using the uh, Croatian pronunciation. Uh, so. <laughs> I wanted to open this up again and look at this book and show these pages because um, it was one of the things that, Stephen, you made clear to me, which I was really surprised by, is you draw this stuff. You draw these graphic no novels digitally um, in yeah. something called Manga Studio. Manga Studio is this amazing program. Um, it is really good for doing that smooth Jeff Smith kind of line. Um, if you're wanting to do anything more organic, uh, it, it kind of lacks in that area but if you're seeking to kind of put together a, a very a very clean Jeff Smith kind of line work it's very ideal it's pretty incredible now if you wanted to say just uh, do your layouts in manga studio and then print them out on board and then you know ink it for that more organic look could you could do that right yeah I thought about doing that because it still has a lot of um, incredible time-saving tools that even to a uh, someone who works traditionally, I think that they could find um, just skip a lot of the steps that they're usually uh, involved in when when you make a comic. I, I actually hear that a lot from people where they're they're sort of like, oh well, I started doing manga studio and it increases their uh, production time so dramatically because uh, just the various tools that they can use kind of just streamline streamlines the process for them. So, um, real quick, what, what, what specific parts are you talking about that is saving you time on? Like, what, what pre-production or, or production parts? Um, they have a lot of um, just kind of time-saving options. It's kind of like having your own assistant. Um, there, I'll, I'll be able to show you guys these neat tools that we have here, but there's a panel cutter tool, which does all of the panel ruling for you. Um, there is a perspective... Um, horizon point where you can set a horizon point and all lines will be drawn toward it um, so you can kind of skip the whole a lot of the struggles that um, perspective grids can usually give you when you're drawing traditionally. <laughs> we talked about this in Comics Great episode 24 with Chris Hastings and, and he, he dropped that bomb on me that there's a perspective tool 
that will automatically map your lines onto a perspective grid without you having to do all the pre-ruling with rulers and everything. Yeah. My jaw dropped. Yeah. Uh, and then and then 20 people lined up on the internet to say, geez, you didn't know about this guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny. I was, uh, I was talking back uh, uh, end of last year to my friend Laura Innes, who does the Dreamer mm -hmm. uh, webcomic. And she had uh, a bunch of us were at her house, and she had this table set up that like had an extension of paper that so she could set up perspective lines yeah, yeah. you know to, so she could you know get her points in there and then she's like and then i found out about i think it was manga studio she's like oh, you know i designed this whole desk extension so that i could do this and now you know the computer's gonna let her do it you kids, Boom. you kids and your new technology. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so th there's a couple time saving things in there, but I'm wondering if we could get a demo on how these inking lines work. Because, you know, I, I just got it myself. There was a sale a couple months ago, and uh, I got it for, like, I got the full version, the EX version for 60 bucks, which is, yeah. Oh, man. It, wow. Yeah, so yeah. I, I I didn't really have the money at the time, but I was like, well, three hundred dollars, sixty dollars. I got to pull the trigger on this. It was a fifteen yeah. minute, one of those Amazon fifteen minute sales, you know. Yeah. Um, but I haven't had a chance to really goof around with it yet, and I've been told that the inking in Manga Studio is way more natural and um, analogous to true inking than, say, in Photoshop. Uh, I'm yeah. wondering if you can show us a little bit on how how you do what you do. Sure, I can do that. All right, this is why okay. everybody should watch the video at uh, comicsaregreat.com slash CAG46 is when, after this episode is done. Mm -hmm. That's where it will be, the video. Yep. All right. Uh, All right, can you guys see my screen? Sure can. I'm going to see if I can reduce my picture. So, I think there's actually a deal right now. Um, I'm not quite sure. It might be on Amazon, but they're selling the full version for $99. So I, yep, the price... Yeah, uh, <laughs> Scott Yoshinaga of Nemu Nemu, N-E-M-U dash N-E-M-U, just posted in the chat. Manga Studio EX4 is on sale now for $99, and uh, it's at, well, it'll be in the show notes. Uh, it's at fastspring.com slash macware slash product slash Manga Studio EX4 Mac question mark source and so on. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. But you can just do a yeah. search for it, and I believe it is a Mac-only version of Manga Studio, if, as I understand it, that's on ah. sale. So. Hmm. I, I've been thinking about getting Manga Studio, and I don't draw anymore. I'm like, mm, maybe. It'd probably be good for lettering yeah. comics. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, if we have time, we can go into But I, I'm so curious to see somebody actually do some drawing. And, and another thing I'm going to put in the show notes is um, Eric Orchard, Inky Bat on Twitter, uh, posted a, a link, some links to some great Dave Gibbons videos where he did like a, a full-on Manga Studio webinar. And uh, th that's a... There's a YouTube link that I'll post oh, in Oh, that the... ties into our earlier uh, discussion of Before Watchmen. See? Oh, you recursive. bring it right around. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. I, I almost looks like I know what I'm doing. So, uh, okay, so we're looking I, at some page spreads on the screen. Yeah, this is how I organize my book. Um, you start out by, you can create uh, what's called a story file. And um, these are all of my p pages um, placed down so I can get kind of a um, bird, bird's eye view of the work. And this is actually the third book, uh, which I'm currently working on right now. Hope to, hopefully we'll have it out in maybe December, but we'll see. And um, I've created kind of a demo page to just show you guys the basic, some of the basic stuff we can do. Uh, oh, I think there's also, and I, I'd have to find the link to it, but Doug Tenaple did a Manga Studio demo as well. Uh, if you guys are familiar with... Um, Ghostopolis. I think he. I think he did the entire book in Manga Studio. Hmm. And that guy does two graphic novels a week. So right? yeah, exactly. He, he's 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 part mutant, but also I'm sure Manga Studio helps a little bit with some of that. Yeah. Yeah. I was hearing that um, for his one of his recent books, I think Monster Island. He he just inked on top of the thumbnails. He didn't even go to a pencil wow. stage. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, I think it's, I, oh yeah, that's that's a new kind of ridiculous. Yeah, I think Mark um, Norton, who does BattlePug.com, mm -hmm. I think he also uses Manga Studio. It seems to me like he's one of the people that was talking about how how much it's it's sped up his production time. Just it, like, it, it, more and more cartoonists are switching to it. It's really astonishing to me how how quickly people are abandoning Photoshop. And it's weird as a guy who has been in the photo, Adobe ecosystem since 1994. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, what's the industry standard? Of course you use it. But I'm hearing more and more people are using this now, and there's got to be a reason. That's why I'm yep. hoping we can see Stephen do some drawing here. Yeah, let me let me just pitch it for you. So right now I've created a panel ruler layer. 
I think um, the learning curve in this program is a little steeper than um, than uh, Photoshop, just because the tools are a little quirkier. But once you understand it, you realize, oh, this is a program that is built for making comics. So I've opened my. Uh, this is a um, panel ruler right here, and I have opened my panel cutting tool, and uh, I'm gonna just rule out some lines right here. Oh, nice. So you're just like chopping out bits of the the master page panel and then it's got yeah. presets on the gutters too so i'm pulling and then i just pulled the panel off the page to make a, a bleed mm -hmm. and um yeah and i'm done <laughs> wow. so i'm gonna uh rasterize it because up until this point i can change the i can change the positions of the panels and usually i'll pencil it at this point um, so that I can still move around elements before I decide to commit to it. But um, I'm going to just raster it to show you guys what it gives you. Rasterize it. Let's see here. Which is changing uh, it from paths to actual pixels. Yeah. Hmm. So here it's turned into pixels, so now it's inked, so to speak. And what I really like about this is on my... Um, on my inks layer, when I do start inking eventually, I can draw a line, and it won't go beyond the oh, panel nice. because it fill automatically fills in um, the gutters with a white. So that kind of because often when you go to the edge of a panel, you want to try to imply that there's something beyond it, and that's just a really neat shortcut for doing that. Now, is there a, an override setting if you wanted to be, you know, breaking the border? Or? If you want to be all Walt Simonson about it. I, I was thinking Gil Kane, but Walt yeah. is an excellent ex example. Well, thank you. Do you, you mean know. breaking the border? Do you mean like... Yeah, uh, like popping out of the panel. Yeah, having, having yeah. you know, somebody's now armor. Yeah, layer, you can either draw on top of it in a different layer, or you can erase oh, that's erase cool. the panel as you please. Um, ah. You can just work with it that way. And once and once you've got it erased, the, the that... Uh, that function stops. Nice. So, so you got some penciling layers in there. Do you do your penciling in the program as well, or are you importing sketches? Um, I do do my penciling here. I actually, this book, I tried to do thumbnailing, but I, I found I couldn't. Uh, for whatever reason, there's something about paper that forces you to commit to the lines you're making. And I noticed that when I was trying to thumbnail. Oh, we lost your audio there. I'll help we didn't lose the connection. Oh. It looks like it looks like that Skype just choked a little bit. And oh, I was adjusting every there scene. We oh there we go. Um, hey, he's like on this layer, all I can do is draw in blue. And in Photoshop sometimes I notice when I was ink what? Oh, I we've we've got a little bit of a delay going on. I'm just curious if you could back up about like five seconds of what you were saying because we lost your audio for a few seconds there. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I, this is a pencil layer. Uh, all, everything that's drawn on this layer will be that nice photo blue. Um, one of the things that I, I've noticed that in Photoshop happens when in Photoshop is uh, you can, like sometimes you'll try to keep your pencil layer separate, but I would accidentally ink on top of the um, on top of my pencil layer, and I wouldn't know it. But with, with this, the way they have it set up, it's pretty much impossible because whenever I go to the pencil layer, it's always going to be in this light blue color. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. So, yeah, because like if, you, if you had multiple layers in Photoshop and you just started drawing between layers and you set your ink color at blue, you wouldn't necessarily know what layer you're on unless, yeah. unless you were looking actively at your layers palette. But this will automatically change whatever ink color you have to this non-photo blue look. Yeah, and that's the thing. Um, I, I hear you can color in this program, but I haven't really figured it out. So it's great for black and white, but like I said, the color of your pen changes depending on um, depending on the layer that you're on, like on the the, the setting of the of what because like colors are determined by layers. It's kind of associated that way, and you you really don't change colors. I, I'm sure there's a way. I just haven't figured it out. Um, but I think Photoshop is still the best coloring tool as far as coloring goes. Now, you, you're using a Cintiq, right? That, um, the graphics tablet that is essentially a screen that you draw on. 
Yeah, I, I did use um, just a stylus for a little while, and that served me pretty well. I know there's a hefty price tag on the Cintiq, but... But, All right. but you were able to do this on a regular graphics tablet as well? Um, I was. It wasn't, it wasn't as natural. You know, it, it didn't flow as nicely, but I think there's, you can get to a certain point where you're really comfortable with the tablet, and uh, it's, it, it's still a really good program just because of all the extra little perks. Um, Yuki, Yuki in the chat is saying that you can change which color will be the alternate of black on the penciling layer, and blue is the default, but uh, this person always switches theirs to red. So I'm guessing just by like double tapping on the layer or something, you can change, or, or in that color palette in the bottom of your toolbar, you can change which will be your penciling color. Yeah, down here. Um, I see. This little, these three boxes here is where you can uh, hmm. change the color of the layer. And, and sometimes I'll just have you know, four or five different layers uh, with different colors on them if I want to work in color. Because you can still export the colors. It's just kind of weird working one layer at a time. Um, so with at this point, um, I made I set up this file to be kind of like a cooking show where you like you set it, you do your prep time, and then you're like, it now allow 20 minutes to bake, and you, then you pull out. <laughs> We finished things. So how good is I'm your Rachel just, Ray voice? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to um, turn the settings up. So here's the finished pencil um, pencil layer for part of this. And then I want to show you the perspective tool. One of the tricky things about this program is it's tempting. You, you want to use the tools, but sometimes the tools will use you if you're not careful. Um, for instance, if you do use the perspective layer, the perspective tool, um, if you're inking with it, then everything seems very like a diagram, kind of um, very straight lines, and it's hard to. It makes it very inorganic. Uh, it looks like a manga, basically, <laughs> um, like with the very precise technical drawings. So what I like to do is I I'll use the perspective tool, but on a pencil layer, and then I'll just use a freehand inking layer on top of it. I see what you're saying. So y when you do your um, background elements, you want it to have that a little bit of that freehand wobble yeah. to it rather than a very crisp, diagrammatical, precise line on it. And that's a taste yeah. thing, right? And some people yeah, may... I think it's, it's just you got to know that it's there or else, you, you know, mm -hmm. um, hard on you. So I'm going to... Uh, I'll just delete this layer. But just, just to show you the perspective tool, which is really neat. I'll, I'll do some big lines on my pencil layer of what I want the room to look like. And then I'll set a perspective point, which is um, this right here, this, this line. And I'll set the horizon line. And you can have two, up to three um, perspective uh, vanishing points. And then once you start drawing, let's see here. Once you start, then all of the lines are going to go toward the layer and it's really easy to kind of carve a three-dimensional space out for yourself mm -hmm. it's not really showing on the screen just yet oh i think we've got like a, a about a four second delay uh on the video between your audio there we go okay mm -hmm. so every line you draw on the ceiling is now pointing directly to that vanishing point you put behind mal's head exactly yeah and um uh, that really kind of pops the drawing because it's hard to eyeball perspective all the time sometimes you can get away with it but so I'll just make these really quick dictations of what the perspective is supposed to be. And uh, then when I go back and ink on top of it, I can make it more organic by just the pen that I use. So it's automatically making your vertical lines perpendicular to the horizon line as well. Um, ver vertical lines? Yeah, like the, like the table yeah, legs. Exactly, and, yeah. Oh, that's crazy. So so you so whenever you go, you can do your ninety degree lines, uh, but then any angled line will go toward the horizon line. And it's it's a little. I don't know if you guys will be able to see it, but I also have um, way way out. Like maybe if you were to put it into real space, it would be two hundred feet away from the page. I have this perspective horizon point. I can't even scroll that far. Um, that is really far off the page, but. Um, Instead of just having a vertical line, so, some of them are kind of slanting toward this 
horizon point that's really far off the page. So it's so. it's two point perspective, but just the other point would be to use Paul's example of, of your friend Laura Innes, who had this would be if she had a table that went out of the door of the house and down the street to the bus stop. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of a, a neat advantage. Um, and then the last couple of things I was ho hoping to show you guys. Um, it is if you're going to letter. It is kind of nice, but the lettering's pretty f funky. Um, Lots of folks usually, are saying in the chat, yeah. Yeah. So oh, I've got the I've got the lettering here. Um, I've got the lettering here that uh, I I usually put the lettering in before I start penciling, which is another really nice aspect because it's nice to consider the bu the speech bubbles as part of the um, you know composition. Yeah. Um, but once you get it's it's finicky, but it works. So I, I used to actually on my first book, I I would export it and letter it in Photoshop. But with the recent versions, you you can get away with it. Um. So let's see here. I'm gonna I'm gonna do some inking real quick and show you guys why I'm so excited about this program. There, uh, I'm on a vector layer right now, and um, what is so neat about the vector layer is you can edit your lines after you lay them down. Um. There's a there's a principle in inking where you want to um, I don't know if you guys are too far behind, but now we're uh, watching as far you ink the video, but we're watching you ink uh, Chad's or I mean Mouse Head, and now we're looking at you drawing some different lines next to the word balloon there. Yeah, um, so I've drawn two lines. When you're inking, uh, if you have two lines approaching each other, you can uh, imply that they go behind each other in different relationships, it's kind of hard to explain, but mm. just depending on how thick they get or, or whatever, like um, this line, the line at the bottom seems to be, it's more, um, it, it, it implies that it's going behind the object. Uh, let me just, I'll just show you that in a different example. <laughs> We're talking about line value here a little bit, yeah? Yeah. Uh, you'll see it a lot in Jeff Smith's work where he, You'll have the line approach something, and then. So I'm gonna start drawing uh, mouse hair again. All right, where do you guys see right now? Are, are we caught up? I see you do you, you the little cow lick, and then you did the back contour of his head. Oops. Yeah. So the the. Um, now we're looking at your Twitter. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> It was, a, it was an instinct. So uh, there's a type of, you can set your eraser so that when you erase part of the line, it will delete itself up to the intersection of another line. So just to show you what that looks like. Um, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And what's so useful about that is when you're, um, like if I was inking his sleeve down here, uh, I could make the sleeve I could just draw straight through and delete the bits that I don't need. And now I have line work that implies that his arm goes like directly behind the collar. Gotcha. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Yeah. And this is the yeah. kind of stuff that when I'm, I see, I still ink uh, on paper. And so when I'm, I, when I'm drawing with my crow quill, I do that exact thing where I'll just intersect lines because I want it to look like a natural thing, like the, the foreground background relationships. And I'll just go into Photoshop and very painstakingly erase all those crossovers pixel by pixel. Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, it makes me so excited to be able to have that tool <laughs> like that. There's other um, ridiculous things that I, I don't really use much. You can also grab the points and move them around. If you want to just adjust things slightly, <laughs> so you can you actually adjust that? like the vector paths. So these ink lines are vector lines, then. Yeah, after you've done it, uh, these are vector lines, and so you can export it at whatever resolution you want. I at twelve hundred DPI, which is I think why the lines look so sharp in the books, is because it's it's a twelve hundred DPI book. <laughs> wow. Mm. What are your file cool. sizes like? File sizes, um, you'd be surprised. Uh, the Manga Studio is a really tight program. Um, it can, it, it seems to run really a lot faster than um, Photoshop. Sometimes when you're inking in Photoshop, you'll drag the pen across the screen and it 
uh, it takes a while for the line to catch up to your stylus. But you don't see that lag here in, in Manga Studio. And the file sizes, I'll, I'll, I'll put them in TIFFs. So TIFFs are naturally very compact since it's just white and just black. Um, and they actually are, are relatively manageable. Hmm. Super cool. Uh, and I'm trying to think if they're, yeah, we're going to zoom up to the final page here. Um, oh, speech bubbles. Another thing that's really useful for speech bubbles is um, because we, we can use these vector paths, uh, the way I draw my speech bubbles is um, I'll make a circle. And I'm going to, here's another thing. You can also increase the smoothness of the line. I'll, so I'm going to increase something called the correction, which allows the, um, it takes the wobble out of your line and naturally smooths it. Hmm. Yeah, this is in a lot of vector drawing programs like Flash, and I believe it's in Illustrator. Yeah, and that's a really nice thing to have to get that extra level of smoothness. So I'll just draw the speech bubble, and then I'll use that neat eraser tool to to the parts that I don't need. Yeah, so now you're just going to make it all look like it's one. Oh, my gosh. That is yeah. crazy cool. Okay, oh, cool. That, that alone is, is a super handy tip. Because that's going to make your inking lines that much more natural if you're not uh, being so concerned about getting them to in Because, like, you know, when you see people working and they'll be inking and they'll, like, oh, I'm coming up to the intersectional lines, they'll slow down. Yep. And that'll affect the arc of the inking line, right? And so yeah. here's a finished page. Now so we're it's nice to be able to have that force. Yeah, I think we lost you again. Yeah. yeah. Your your audio keeps blipping out, and I think it's probably because of the screen sharing. We'll we'll kick off the screen sharing in just a second here. So can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you okay now. Okay, yeah, that's um, I think that's about all that I had to share with you guys today. If there's any questions from the chat or anything, I could answer if it was. Yeah. Oh, and wow. somebody is saying in the chat that coloring a 1200 DPI TIFF file will require lots of memory, though. Yes, indeed. that's true. Yeah. Yeah. No. No question. Um. Funny enough, just yesterday, um, we had Scott Yoshinaga, no, not yesterday, this would be on Sunday, so a couple days ago by the time of this recording, Scott Yoshinaga and Audrey Furichi of Nemu Nemu, who I mentioned earlier, uh, they were doing a talk at the Ann Arbor District Library via Skype, all the way from Honolulu, and... Wow. Uh, yeah, it was super cool. So it's a new thing we're doing at the at the library where we have this this monthly comics artist forum where we have a guest speaker come in and we're trying to alternate between local guests and then guests from all over the country. And they won't fly you out to be in Honolulu <laughs> with them. No, that would have been awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have that much sway here yet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but, nice. I think the library will sponsor a trip to Hawaii for you guys. Yeah. Oh man, I, I would. Yeah. That, well, I'm working on it. I'm twisting my mustache. <laughs> but um, but anyway, they they did a demo of how Audra works in uh, Manga Studio, and she takes the finished line art and then imports it to Photoshop, and mm -hmm. and then works there. Uh, and I think she jacks it down to 600 DPI to work on it there. But even then, 600 DPI coloring is going to be pretty. Uh, Extensive. Oh, Scott Yoshinaga found the uh, the fast spring sale for Manga Studio for Windows. Scott, oh, you yeah. are awesome. So that's awesome. in the that's in the chat. Go ahead, uh, Stephen. No, I was just saying that's awesome. <laughs> so uh, we can cut, shut off the screen share and go back to looking at your handsome face, and we can uh, finish up because uh, <laughs> we got only a few minutes till we're going to switch to book review time. Um. But, uh, man, super useful stuff. I, I also should say that, uh, you know, we're talking about being in groups and being in anthologies. Steven, you were in an anthology not too long ago, right? Um, it feels like a while ago. Are you talking about parables? or? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It was a really exciting um, initiative put on by Mike Mayhack, who does uh, Cleopatra in Space, mm -hmm. uh, which is a webcomic you guys might be familiar with. And uh, he basically he was looking at the format of the flight comics because anthology comics was the, kind of a new thing back then. And um, so he's like, we should um, put together these stories and, and uh, but have um, the kind of the whole theme of the works was stories of, of faith, stories of, uh, of love and, and um, kind of stories with more religious themes. So uh, a lot of really talented artists got together and we, we made a book, we got everything ready to go and and I think something happened in the market and the, the publisher backed out and uh, mm -hmm. it's taken a while. It's now available, um, I forget the website, we, we did, finally did find the publisher but Parablecomic.com. Like it was four years too late, so yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, that's parablecomic.com. Mike my uh, my hack may hack. Oh, just covered up your mic when you said that. So how does how do you say it again? May hack. Uh, he he's tearing up the Google Pluses with some of his uh, Bat Batgirl and Supergirl comics too. I don't know if you've seen any of those. those yeah, they're they're super super cute. Uh, but yeah, very talented artists. People in the chat are already saying that. Uh, yeah, he's he's pretty incredible. So um, okay, well before we kick over to uh, book reviews, we gotta say uh, what 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 events are we gonna be at? What kind of shout outs do we want to do for stuff that we're doing? Uh, where, where are you gonna be where, next, yeah. Stephen? I'm actually um, getting ready. To, I'll be out of the country for the next six months living in Japan. So wow. um, I'm broadcasting right now from my parents' house. I moved all my stuff over there, and I'm going to spend the last couple of weeks with them before I leave um, in, in the middle of February. Um, I've got this really neat opportunity. Uh, I'm going to be moving over there. I'm still going to be working full-time as a cartoonist, but in my free time, I'm going to be helping out um, with a, a missions organization called Mission to the World. So I'm really looking forward to that. Are you going to still be working while you're over there on your comics too, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think the biggest thing I'm nervous about right now is how I get my Cintiq uh, through the airlines safely. Yeah. But <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. really looking forward to it. It'll be a neat, um, just a neat experience. That that is one for anybody who's ever lusted after a Cintiq. That's got to be the one downside. Is that's an expensive and delicate <laughs> piece of equipment. You know, yeah, dude, traveling on um, anything that's that's got that kind of uh, yeah. price tag. It, you know, and and coupled with the uh, okay, yeah, for, for sure. Like you can't just throw it in a backpack, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you're gonna be in Japan, and uh, people can follow you at Stephen McCrane on the Twitters. Oh, we didn't even get a chance to talk about Doodle Alley. We're gonna have to have you back maybe yeah. when you're in Japan. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. So in the middle of the night, you'll you'll Skype in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll Skype in when I <laughs> to one in the morning or something. There's actually um, as far as plugs go. I am running a contest on my website right now. It's at malandchad.com slash contest. And uh, it's kind of a basic fill in the speech bubble thing. We have Mal and Chad with the, with the cover from biggest, uh, from um, Food Fight. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you, you can figure out what they're saying and uh, send in your submission, um, and if your submission gets chosen, uh, they'll send you co signed copies of the first and second book. And uh, I will draw you as a Mal and Chad character. And uh, you'll get a drawing from me. So super cool, awesome. Okay, so um, and we got to give Paul a shout out because we're about to do book recommendations. So what do you got there, Paul? Uh, the my my latest to hit the stores, uh, Twisted Journeys number twenty, Peril at Summerlin Park. It's uh, the Twisted Journeys are a combination of prose and comics, primarily comics, and they uh, the reader gets to pick their own path through the adventure. Um, I got to work with uh, Sandy Carruthers, who uh, uh, did uh, a couple other projects I worked on, uh, Terror and Ghost Mansion and uh, You the Great Conquering the Flood. Um, Terror and Ghost Mansion was another uh, Twisted Journeys. And uh, it's, it's, you know, the, the response on these has been really great when I talk to librarians, when I talk to uh, uh, kids and parents. They are really, really jazzed about this. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the whole kind of uh, being able to, to go through all the different variations on the adventure. Choose your own adventure. I didn't say that. <laughs> 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 you're, not, you're not infringing on any trademarks here. I'm doing all the infringing uh, yeah, on trademarks sorry. here. But uh, find your fate, uh, choose your path, uh, pick, your, pick your go, and yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. yeah. And plus, it gives you, you know, it's. It, it, it's interesting because really it it does kind of bring a, almost uh, the choose your own adventures and and books like that have always sort of you know now people do video games and that's you know they go to a certain point and this you know this happens and it's sort of like you know in a way video game in book form. What a great segue for our, our the guests who are about to walk in the room because I think video games are where cartoonists and cart cartooning writers, comic book writers, need to have their eye on in the future for uh, 
what is be the future of media, transmedia, and all that stuff? That's as I set more you up more. for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did. Thank you. I, I, th thanks for the softball. It's, it's, I was going to say almost like I planned it. <laughs> it's almost like you know what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, Paul's story can be found at Storyville.com. Uh, I'm a sad, sad man. Dot com and no. Twitter. No. Com. No. I am so sad. No. And Storyville on Twitter <laughs> or, or Storyville on Twitter. That's S T O R R I E V I L L E. Yes. And no. and on Facebook, look for the man with the explosion behind him. Oh, you're not oh, using that avatar. I'm using that, but uh, I may have to switch back because that was a pretty awesome one. That, that's an awesome avatar. So, so on the Facebooks and on the Google Pluses, you're everywhere where there's internet. That's true, although I haven't been doing the Google Pluses as much as I, I should. Uh, that's okay. Uh, Twitter and Facebook. Twitter and Facebook. And yeah. you, can, you can be bored about me going like, oh, I did some exercise and boy, do I ache. Uh, also, when you get mad about Watchmen. So. That's, I, oh, okay. <laughs> Mad about other people getting mad, mad about, about Watchmen. Watchmen. Now that that's actually probably more accurate. <laughs> that's, that's closer to the truth. Anyway, Stephen, great meeting you. And uh, hey, I really appreciate it. And uh, keep keep up the great work. That stuff's amazing. So well, thank, thank you, you, Paul. So okay, right. while 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 we do the switcheroo with the guests, I hope you can stick around, Stephen, for the book recommendations part because uh, Sharon Iverson is about to come in here, and I and I just know that she's got to meet you. We got to get your books in the library if they aren't there already. Uh, Absolutely, I appreciate it. Well, while they come in, we could talk a little bit very quickly about the Doodle Alley comics essays that you do. Uh, can you tell us about those just for a second? Yeah, um, I'm really excited about them, and I was sad to, I, I, I'm not updating currently, but there's about eight, uh, seven or eight um, essays on, on creative sustainability on uh, my website called doodlealley.com. And uh, they're basically, I just break down simple concepts for workflow and um, how to organize your life. And just try to tell it in comics format, which is a, uh, I don't know, just a great way to break down, break down information and just show concepts. And so um, they they had a lot of great pull. People were very excited about it. But I had to start work on the on the next book, so I wasn't able to keep updating. But um, but it's it's a new take. Uh, well, I shouldn't say new. It's a unique take on the whole, you know, productivity, uh, staying motivated kind of blog post because you do it actually in comics form. You do it in your natural language, right? Which I think yeah. is super cool. Makes them that much more compelling for a cartoonist to read, at any rate. So um, yeah, I get to, it's a nice platform to be able to talk about just all of those struggles that you feel like you only have as you're working in your your apartment or your studio or wherever you are, all by yourself, and it's just all these brick walls that you bang your heads against. And um, just try to put it as encouragement for like any artist, really, not just a cartoonist, but yeah. Yeah, and, and, and one of the reasons we talk about this stuff and then we do these, these kinds of blogs is because uh, when you're starting out in the stuff, as we talked about at the beginning of this episode, when we start out, we're all alone and special, and boy, those kids over there look like they're having an awfully good time, and oh, who knew that this was <laughs> a little bit like work? Uh, yeah, you know, we, we always need something to kick us in the butt every once in a while to keep us going again. Uh, not, not self-help necessarily, but like a little bit of like, hey, I was there too, or I, or I am there. You know, you're not quite so alone and special, right? Yeah, so. absolutely. But that's at doodlealley.com, and thank you, Eric, for posting it into the chat. So now I turn to uh, our next segment, book recommendations. we got a full house today. we got uh, three kings, two queens. Uh, I guess I ma that makes me one of the queens. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and who's missing? She said three kings. <laughs> oh, we got, we, got, we got Dave Carter. Oh, Paul. Uh, yeah, yeah, and Paul's story. Mm. And then we got Steve, okay. Stephen McCraney. Yes. Uh, Dave Carter. Okay, I'm so excited to have you on, Dave. Uh, oh, there's, there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> well, there's a lot here that... that Make sure present presence important to my mission with comics are great. Um, what, what do you do for a living? You what run a library. You run uh, dusty old books and. Well, well okay. So <laughs> I'm um, I'm an engineering librarian at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm also a, uh, the video game archivist for the University Library, and I also uh, select the comic books uh, for the library's collection. That is so cool. So you run a video game. We got a video game library, people, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. If that doesn't come on, and then and then <laughs> and, and then you also have comics in the University of Michigan Library. Yeah, so, so I always say, you know, I. I I work now with video games and comic books all those times. When my mom said when I was 12 years old, <laughs> you're wasting your life reading those comic books and playing those video games, and now I get paid for it. So well, they say cool. tur turn what you love into your job, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but we should also say that uh, you, know, you, you are actively present on the Internet. You uh, are at Dave Reed's Comics on the Twitters, mm -hmm. and uh, you did a talk at Ignart, Ignart, Ignite Ann Arbor 5. Right, which, with... with same time that you did. Yeah, that's there. right. Yeah, we did. The, uh, I, I, I set you up with a whole big talk on why comics are so awesome. I, I did a talk called Comics Are Great. And then you followed up with 
awesome comics you should read, where you uh, dug I, in. I did a book talk, basically. <laughs> you did. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I was I was pleased to see that you went into like the deep recesses of Silver Age with like Doom Patrol ish kind of stuff with Purple Gorillas, which is from the Julia Schwartz days oh, yeah. of put a gorilla on it, it will sell, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> so people can find that at igniteshow.com. Uh, you can just do a search for uh, Dave Carter or Awesome Comics You Should Read, and we'll put a link in the show notes for that. So great. Uh, so so yeah. So what what are you here to talk about besides the 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 mini comics recommendations? Let's give a plug to this first. Right. So um, I, I asked. I sort of butted myself into the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> As, Jersey, can I come on and give a plug for our mini comics day we've got coming up? It's <laughs> like, sure, when you want to come. Um, so uh, we're doing a, the second annual mini comics day at the Duderstadt Center, uh, which might imply that we did this last year, which is true. Um, and so this year it's going to be March 10th, which is a Saturday, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, the Duderstadt Center is on North Campus. That usually means getting on a bus for a lot of people to come up to North Campus, but it can be done. It's only about 10 to 15 minutes. You can do it. It's also Saturday, so there, you'll be able to find parking up there um, yeah. most likely as well. Parking is still free on Saturdays in Ann Arbor, is it not? Uh, or is it Sunday? I'm uh, thinking Sunday. Sunday is Sunday. Sunday. Whoops. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's the weekend and it's North Campus so and Saturday so you should be able to find parking up there. But anyway, uh, what Mini Comics Day is? Um, if you've heard of Twenty Four Hour Comics Day before, uh, where you try to create a twenty four page comic in twenty four hours, and we hosted one of those uh, in late two thousand ten, and it it was great fun and it nearly killed me staying up for twenty four hours as the responsible adult. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's different after the age of twenty seven to yeah. do that, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. Yeah, um, you know, anybody else could come and go as they pleased and stuff like that. I sort of had to be there, um, <laughs> so I'm like this is great. I don't want to do it again for <laughs> until I've waited long enough until I forgot what it was like to yeah. do that. Uh, but then we did Mini Comics Day, uh, which was last year. There was uh, International Cartoonist Conspiracy, I think, is the name of the mm -hmm. group. Yeah. They sponsored this National Mini Comics Day, and um, and we so we participated as being a site for that. And that is just eight hours and do an eight-page mini comic, which is much more um, doable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. for people, you don't have to stay up all night. You don't have to be eating crappy food for 24 hours and plying yourself with coffee all the time and, and whatnot. Make yourself crazy. Right. Yeah. And so we did that too, and, and that was a lot of fun. And um, so we decided to do that again this year, um, mostly at the uh, request of Phoebe Gluckner, who's uh, the art school faculty up there. She's teaching her class on comics, and she asked if, if we would be doing that again this year because she wanted to have her class come and participate in the Mini Super Comics cool. Day. Um, so I'm like, yeah, sure, if you're going to strongly recommend that your class of 20 kids come and participate then by all means i'm going to open up that door and let that happen and this is open to the public too yeah, yeah. oh yeah yeah, yeah open so to yeah the public. so um anybody around we did like i said we did last year i think we had about 15 people come in and participate and it's a lot of fun you know you're sitting there in a room with other people who are creating comics and uh, there's lots of buckling down and, and drawing and then lots of talking and, and sharing and, and things like that. And it's, so it's a social event too, exactly, right? Because exactly. as, as Steve and I were talking about earlier, we're going back to this idea of like socializing and, and getting to, uh, uh, you know, actually be around other artists. This is a very, uh, what's, what's the word for it? Solitary activity, making comics, right? right, right. Uh, why mini comics though? Why not a full, I mean, come on, mini, that's diminutive. That is uh, not as important. Um, well, I beg to differ, Jersey. <laughs> so um, mini comics are, are, yes, most of them are small, um, although they don't have to be small. Um, our, our sort of definition of mini comics and the mini comic collection we have at the library is anything that's sort of um, handmade, um, mm -hmm. that is, you know, one person doing stuff and then going to the photocopier or, pr or printing it off and then folding it and stapling it and, and doing it that sort of way. So some mini comics are indeed mini and small. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, you can put them right there. Right. Uh, so um, I chose some of the ones that we that were created at last year's um, mini sure. comics thing. Um, so this one is by um, Adam Buttrick, who also works at the library. It's his four-page Freudian fever. Um, so he did that, and this is sort of a standard half-page uh, size size comic. And he did this as sort of a stream of consciousness. He was just like, whatever came into his mind next, that's what he that's what he put in the next panel. Yeah, of putting that together. Um, this one is mine that I did. It's a uh, the B team and too many monkeys, um, and it's stick figures. And anybody who says I'm not going to participate because I don't have any artistic talent, it, you will do better than me. <laughs> <laughs> and I did one with stick figures. Well, and this looks like XKCD to me. It's, it, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So there's no excuse for not coming and participating. Um, well, and, and that's, that. I mean, you're touching on something that's really kind of an important topic to me is that people, I, as a guy who teaches a lot of comics classes, uh, there's always that person says, but I can't draw this, I can't draw that. And like, that's not what it's about, is it? It's no. about storytelling, first and foremost. And you can use, as long as you can tell that, that, is a, that that's not a cat, that's a man, then right, right. we're somewhere. And it's sometimes it's an arrow pointing to something and saying cat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's some other ones that were put together. This one here is really tiny, the mini and not so many, many comics. Like, so just these little one-page gags uh, that oh, wow. the guy did. He penciled in ink. I just did mine in, in pencil and then photocopied off the pencils because I didn't have time to ink. Mm -hmm. That's another thing when you're doing these quick, you know, eight hours to do eight pages worth of comics. You don't have time to make it perfect. Mm -hmm. And so it sort of, I think for some people, frees them from having to be perfect and sort of just gets you to sort of spit it out. There, yeah, which, yeah, which and can be creatively freeing to do that. Oh, change. oh, absolutely. Yeah, no. I mean, a, a tight deadline will make you be very creative to get yourself out of that corner. Right, right, right. right. Uh, yeah, very much so. And, and the, 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 many comics have a history of being very guerrilla style. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Before there was the web, mm -hmm. uh, you know, before people were doing web comics, if you wanted to sort of get yourself out there, you would do something, you'd photocopy, you'd take it to the conventions, you'd sit there at your table, you'd force it upon people, here, come take a look at my comic. And yep. so that was sort of how people started getting used to doing comics and getting themselves exposed um, to people. And Back then, in the 90s, we called them ash cans. Ash cans, there yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah. yep, yep. Um, so for recommendations, uh, I figured yep. since I was here to talk about mini comics, I'd bring some uh, mini comics to recommend. And these are all local or localist uh, mini comics artists. Um, and if you've heard about mini comics at all, you're probably familiar with Matt Fiesel, mm -hmm. who has been on the show before. Yeah, oh, great, great. So he does uh, Amazing Cynical Man. Um, is one of his. So I brought a couple Cynical Man comics here, and he does stick figures as well. And his he does the most. Oh. Okay. So are we okay? Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so this is um, yeah. So he does stick figures. He does the best stick figures I've ever seen. Um, and very funny, uh, and sort of, uh, it's sort of, I, it's hard to describe his humor uh, unless you read it, and then you immediately recognize it as a Matt Fiesel sort it's of. It's very style smart humor. and absurdist, but it's not ironic absurdist. Right, it's, right. He's not trying to deconstruct anything. He's he's like a, a true comedian, okay. a real comedian making observations about how ridiculous human beings can be sometimes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, he's not out to hurt anybody either, but no. he's still naming what is absurd and wrong and calling it out so right, right. so great he, great guy so he's great um uh, sean beery and I'll, I'll oh sean beery i need to get him on the show yes. yeah he's he's down in hamtramck um that is i think matt's down in hamtramck too isn't that's he? right yeah right. And, yep. and sean beery i think teaches at specs howard now okay um you know the the visual arts uh, college over there in that area yeah so great. um so a couple of his um cool jerk and homo gal which i was introduced to in the 90s have you ever read this sharon no i haven't oh it's so wildly <laughs> funny yeah <laughs> It's um, the, 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 the defenders of Detroit's cast corridor. Um, <laughs> cool Jerk's powers are he can't be harmed by anything. And Homo Gal's powers are she's just awesome. She's just awesome and really tough and very, very uh, spirited. And yeah, Cool Jerk, he, he got his powers from, um, I think he was crossbred with some kind of uh, self flat worm or something. A flat worm, yeah. yeah. So if you cut his arm <laughs> off, he'll just grow a new arm, you know? Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and she doesn't really profess to be a superhero as much, but she's sort of along for the ride with him as he's right. trying to be a superhero. Right, yeah, right. wildly funny comic. So. Yeah, so I can show a few pages here for the folks at home. Yep. On that, and then um, Jumbo Jape is a collection of his uh, Jape comics. It's it's uh, one to four page little strips um, they put together. Yeah. Um, I think Sean is is probably for an older teen audience. Oh, definitely. His stuff is. Um, yeah. For that, his stuff is a little bit on the edgier side. Yeah. Uh, he's he's uh, he's also involved, as I, as I understand it, with uh, one of the. Uh, Oh, what is, what is that burlesque, uh, Dr. Sketchy's burlesque drawing uh, get-together? So have you guys heard of this? It's no. like a traveling show. <laughs> Steven, have you heard of this? It's, it's like, it's like no, a... No, I haven't. It's like you get together and you... It's just called Dr. Sketchy's. You can look it up on the Googles later if you guys are interested. But it's like a, it's like a life drawing class, but it's, it's got like a, a, this kind of like a body burlesque kind of aspect to it as okay. well. And that, that, that's the kind of stuff that, that Sean... Uh, <laughs> like if you think of that, then, you, then now you can think of what to, what you, to expect in a Sean Beery book. Right, so. right. Um, so another creator I brought is um, Suzanne Bauman, and mm. she is also in um, Hamtramck. <laughs> so uh, apparently Hamtramck is the mini comics mecca of yeah. Southeast Michigan, um, and she does a lot of lot of little smaller ones that, that she does. Um, and her stuff sort of ranges from she has some slice of life stuff, and she has um, this one here. My mind is made up is sort of a 
political commentary sort of thing, and Planet Pizzo is a humorous sci-fi uh, thing. And I like, it's really kind of tiny, and you can see it sort of flips up and reads, reads this way with one panel to a page mm -hmm. on that. Um, so another thing I like about a lot of the mini comics creators is they like to fold stuff and, and make things move in different ways than your standard 32-page comic book. Have you gone to the Small Press Expo yet? I have not been to SPX. So or, or MoCA, for that matter. Those are both go good shows for getting mini comics. And you, you find really weird stuff where people will make, like... Um, uh, a dodecahedron comic, right? right? right like right. they'll use origami <laughs> and they'll make this comic that you can just roll around and look at, and it'll just move in all those different directions. The story can go in all those different directions. Yeah, you know, we've got one in the in the mini comics collection at, at the library where it's on a scroll. It's a little tiny scroll and it's all rolled up, and then you put it in. You know those. You know those things, the gumball machines that you put a quarter in and you get a prize, and then that little plastic egg-like thing? Mm -hmm. So it's all packaged, rolled up, and then packaged in this little plastic Same. egg thing. And it's just like, that's just great. Yeah, it's and, it, it, it tra it's it's like it's weird because it's like gorilla style, but at the same time, it's like an art object. Right, right. So, yeah, right. it's really interesting stuff being done in the mini-comic scene. It's not just about ash cans, you know? Right, right. Like, like how the publishers used to use it. And then uh, the final uh, creator I brought is Pam Bliss. Oh, yeah, and Michigan Stable. Yeah, she actually lives in northern Indiana, but that's close enough to Michigan, so we'll mm -hmm. count her as one of our own. She comes to a lot of the conventions, she conventions does. here. Uh, Purple Gorilla, which you were just talking about Purple Gorillas earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I just love, love, love her stuff. And I, I, it's hard for me to describe. She's got a small town feel to it. Um, a lot of her comics are about these this group of kids who just likes to hang out and they have adventures in, in the woods and, and things like that. I, I would put her stuff under the qualification or classification of like edgy Garrison Keillor. Okay. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, like yeah. A little bit like yeah. Garrison Keillor if he was cool. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's another one of hers I brought here, The Smell of Midnight, and it's sort of this long format thing. Um, and... Uh, She's very experimental sometimes in her Whoop. things. Can you move it um, up just a little? Oh, yeah, sure. That way, there we go. All right. So, um, so, you know, each of, each of these is one long panel, but then within that one panel, you've got several, like, pseudo panels going on. So it's here, then here, then here. Um, and uh, she's just, every time I read one of her comics, I'm just so delighted uh, to read it. Um, she has a website that hasn't been updated since 2002. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> so I didn't, uh, <laughs> but she's still making comics, and and I, I've met Pam a couple times, and and from what I've gathered from her, it's just not surprising at all that she would just abandon the website and you, just keep making comics. You know Pam when you see her. You can see her across the floor because you always look for that fedora, the fedora, yeah. the long blonde hair, yeah. and uh, the the opinionated uh, attitude. She's she's a lovely woman. And she makes really interesting stuff. So, so somebody uh, somebody's asking in the chat since you are a librarian and you, your job is uh, part of your jobs as librarians is to conserve things. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you keep the, all these comics, these mini comics, in a good state? Right. So when they're not when I'm not bringing them around here, uh, <laughs> we we uh, we have to keep them in our storage uh, space so they're not out in the main. Uh, collection climate controlled um, eh, climate ish <laughs> controlled <laughs> um, we put them in um, we put them in acid free envelopes um, okay. and then uh, and then store them uh, back in there so they're uh, so you do need to request uh, them uh, from the desk if you want us to pull them out of storage for you to see if you come to the library. Uh, they're all all the ones we have are listed in Merlin, which is the library's online catalog uh, so you can see what's there. Uh, come into the library and, and ask us to pull the call numbers out and we'll do that for you. Um, other ways to get comics, mini comics, uh, a couple of the stores in the area, I know Vault has some mini comics and Green Brain uh, carries mini comics uh, from local artists. Mm -hmm. Going to conventions though, I think is the best way to get your hands on mini comics. Uh, oh, yeah. not, not only do you get them and get to look at them, you get to interact with the creators. Um, and, uh, and they're all very, I won't say they're all this way, but <laughs> <laughs> many of them are, are very gregarious people. Yeah, um, who, I, I think that's part of the course. You kind of have to be in order to go to a convention. And if you do and you're not gregarious, you learn quickly to be gregarious. Right, right. Steven, were you a gregarious guy when you first started conventioning? Were you, were you out um, going like, hey, come on over to my table. I'm ready to talk to you. Or were you the yeah, shy guy? I, I still kind of feel like this need to stand up wherever, like... For some reason, it feels like I'm more engaging if I'm standing behind the booth, but it's just not sustainable for a three-day convention. <laughs> <laughs> Your prescription shoes wear out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, for the longest time I had a, a devil of a time not standing and like like just like sketching or or even like keeping that smile on for like a whole three days. Like when you do like a three day show, oh, that's brutal. That's brutal, especially if you do like a mainstream show where like not everybody there is friendly. Um, but uh, you do the indie shows like the SPXs and the MOCAs and it's a completely different feel. Uh, and 
But yeah, yeah, eventually you learn how to be. Uh, oh, Scott Yoshinaka is saying, we stand the entire time at San Diego Comic-Con. Scott, I don't know how you do it. I do not know how you do it. I mean, That's amazing. wearing leg braces or something, you have to be. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we're going to move on to more book recommendations. I want to talk to, and, and uh, Stephen, f please feel free to select something if you want to give a shout-out or a plug to something, but I'm going to turn now to um, the local comics. Uh, one of the people who's very important to the comic scene in Ann Arbor. Is that a better way to put it, Sharon? Yes, because um, I just want Stephen to know that I talked to our comic book or graphic novel selector this morning and made sure she knows about your book coming out. And oh. Your second I really book. appreciate that. Yeah, no, we've got to have it in the collection. I, uh, When Jersey sent out the word that you were a guest, I went on your website and looked at some of your archives, and I'm going like, oh, my God, this is great stuff. <laughs> um, I love the humor between Mal and Chad. It's yeah. just great. <laughs> yeah, so, I forgot to mention. Um, I forgot to mention that just reminds me real quick. Uh, on my website, it's, Mal and Chad originally started out as a comic strip that I did for yeah. my um, college school newspaper, and so... There's over 200 Mal and Chad comic strips available to read on the website um, if you can't get your hands on a copy of the book. Yeah, well, I, I noticed that I was just flipping through um, Jersey's copy here, and it's like, okay, it's not comic strip. You you obviously had to rework this to, yeah. to get it done. But, but again, the humor is fabulous. I just love it. So that's coming to our library soon. And I think well, it was held, so up, much. Yep, held up a little earlier. And the, the other is just one series. Do I hold it up like so? You can put it here. It's, it's glossy. Though. Oh, you're right. Yes. So, so okay. You can hold it up to this, this camera, camera here. So you okay. Can see it on the screen. So this is Jarek Krasoska, and I'm probably saying his name a little wrong. Um, he actually started out as a children's book um, writer and illustrator but his roots are comic books and so lunch lady is a series that he came up with and it was it was spun off of his after his first book was published he went back to his old elementary school and there in the lunch cafeteria was his old lunch lady Jeannie and um, it, it just sort of ignited you know a, a curiosity in him and, and he she mentioned her children and grandchildren he's like you have children? You have grandchildren? You're a human being? You, oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, so from that sprung the whole idea, what are lunch ladies? What are their lives like? And so um, three kids are speculating um, in the storyline initially. This one is Lunch Lady and the Cyborg Substitute. This is book one. And um, they're just kind of wondering about who, it, you know, what is her life like? Um, on the side and what you find out is that she indeed stands up for justice and she can um, spin her spatula well she has a side um, sidekick Betty who is her assistant in the cafeteria and they have a laboratory down below the cafeteria where all sorts of gadgets are created by Betty including the the spatula helicopter that is used in um, several scenes throughout the series but um, and there's a spork that's her um, fork shaped radio phone communicator all sorts of cool stuff and um, so so each book she discovers something's going on in this case it's the cyborg um, substitute and it's there's something really weird because Mr. Connell never misses school he's the most popular teacher and all of a sudden there's this new guy um, taking his place and he's acting very weird rejecting Betty's cookies um, and so it becomes clear that he's not human and that there is something evil afoot and um, so it's it's a series that now is six uh, volumes long. I wonder, after having looked at some of his picture books, if he's going to turn back <laughs> or if comics have totally grabbed him. Because oh, I, I have so. a feeling um, that this this is really where he wants to be. Now, I've looked at, uh, I don't know if you want to hold up some of the other covers, I've looked at the series before, I've, I've, I've uh, read a little bit of it, and it, it, does, it has for what I would say is a PBS Kids kind of vibe, like the shows like Cyber Chase, Arthur. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Um, if Interestingly, I wasn't sure either what the age interest area was, but um, he's been recognized two years in a row with his books by third and fourth graders. And his name has been on a marquee with that recognition in Times okay. Square. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which he's very, oh. very proud of. Um, well, wouldn't you be? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's just, um, his stuff is really fun. And um, I, you know, recommend it 
whether you're a kid or whether you're a grown up like well, me. Well, if, if you're a grown up like me who actually watches Arthur mm -hmm. and Cyber Chase and those shows and, that, and genuinely enjoys them, then I, I bet you mm -hmm. probably get a kick out of that mm -hmm. too. So, did you have something else? Uh, no, well, I just had his picture books, but uh, okay. I was just, yeah. So, that's a big one today is the Lunch that's Lady the, series. That's the Lunch Lady series. Which yes. we'll put into the show notes. So, uh, mm -hmm. Stephen, did you have anybody that you want to give a shout out to? Um, I, all my books are packed oh, up that's right, right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're about to go to Japan, uh, so. <laughs> I recently got into, um, oh gosh. I'm putting you on the There's spot. this manga called, um, uh, I think it's Four Leaf Clover by Mitsuri Adachi. If you guys are familiar. Uh, I'll look it up too. Four Leaf Clover manga. Maybe it's just Clover. Clover manga, yes. Um. All right. Clover was by Clamp. Ah, yes. Uh, that, that, oh, I, no, no. Dave knew. I, I, so. I should have turned to the librarian <laughs> and said, do you know, rather than going to stupid but, yeah, Wikipedia. Is Clamp, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it, it is by Clamp. So oh, are gosh, you talking about that baseball manga? That, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, my wife is reading that right now. Oh, what, what is that one called? Somebody in the chat help us out here. Uh, is it a biography? No, no. no, it's, no, no. It's, 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 a, it's a drama comedy series, and oh. it's a manga series. It's about a young boy who's on a baseball team. Oh. And they have, and there, there's the, the there's four characters. Each have one part of the Clover, um, Clover baseball manga. We'll find that right now. <laughs> oh, cross game. Cross game. Yeah, yep, there, there it yeah, is. So, I I actually um, did an exchange in Japan about three years ago, and I found Adachi's work while I was over there. I was like, this is so amazing. Why don't people know about this? And I was really excited when I saw that they were translating a copy. Um, I think if you're if you're a cartoonist looking to find something a refreshing take on comics, he just has a really incredible uh, approach to it, um, which I've kind of I think the way that he works is he decides that there's only going to be one idea per panel, and sometimes like he'll only have a single speech bubble in a panel. So he's really like decompressed storytelling, really efficient with how he puts things together, and I just I really like the way he he his decompre his his storytelling is so decompressed so. Um, so uh, minute, I guess, so detailed that he can he can do things like show you the reaction before the action, um, which is kind of hard to explain. But uh, he'll show a guy getting splashed in the face, and then he'll show the person who threw it, um, which is the, usually in in comics you'll see like someone throwing throwing the water in their face. But yeah. but he'll kind of switch things around because because he's his storytelling is so decompressed. He has a lot of freedom to play around with how you perceive things. Uh, Scott Yoshinaga saying in the chat that it's very 80s Orange Roadish. I, Orange Road? Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with that one, but Scott yeah. at least likes it. Uh, when you say decompress, I, I want to jump in and say that you know decompression has had a bad rap in the last five years, and because mm -hmm. uh, and you guys are probably familiar with this, yeah. they've like the, this whole idea of, like the mainstream superhero comics all trying to be more quote unquote cinematic. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And so they have three uh, widescreen panels per page, which and then like they thought balloons were passe, and right, you know. Right. <laughs> Um, but this, the decompression you're talking about, Stephen, I think is much more natural to comics. It's not trying to be a film. It's just it's taking its time and it's being contemplative in the storytelling. Yeah. Does that sound fair to say? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Um, if you, I think, uh, if you look at some of Osamu Tezuka's early work, there's this one comic that he does where he's just showing um, a, a kid, a child driving driving down a road, and he breaks it down into it, it, I think it ended up being like a, a just a fifty like a fifty page sequence just for a simple guy driving down a road <laughs> and like breaking really hard and you can see the camera like zoom into the reflection in his eye yeah. and he sees a dog in front of him and breaks really hard and um, that kind of decompression I think there's a certain amount of um, panels that you can or images you can choose to break up a moment if you're trying to portray a moment and if you choose a lot of images that would be decompressed if you if you only choose like one that's that's a little more compressed storytelling right right but yeah i i felt it was important to make that distinction because some people yeah. attribute comp uh, decompression to trying to act like a movie and that's not really what yeah. it means right uh, wow, wow, what a packed episode we had today we're already over time and i know that uh, producer matt dubay is going to uh, have have a conniption if i don't wrap this up soon so uh, Stephen, we should say one more time for people who aren't familiar with your work, uh, you could go to Mal and Chad today and find out more about it. Yes. And, uh, mm -hmm. you can follow you on the, the Twitters at Stephen McCraney. That's Stephen with a PH and McCraney, M-C-C-R-A-I. 
N I E on Twitter. Any other place where you want people to find you? Um, I definitely want people. Uh, we love if people take a look at the little short comics essays that I put on doodlealley.com. Doodlealley.com. That will be in the show notes as well if you can't remember it, folks. Uh, and then we should also thank Mr. Paul Story, uh, who was here earlier, Storyville.com, Storyville on the Twitters, and then Sharon Iverson of AADL.org. Thank you very much once again for all the amazing stuff that you've been doing lately. Uh, the last forum was super, super It was super cool. awesome. I see you said Scott's on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also bugged Aaron about getting caught up with the Nemo Nemo. We have to, we're two volumes behind, so. <laughs> I posted some pictures on Facebook, and yeah. the highlight of the of the the day for me was when all these young kids were yes. lining up to talk yes. to Scott and Audra on Skype uh, uh -huh. at the computer monitor, and yeah. then when uh, Natalia, who's been on the show before, the local nine-year-old superstar of comics, uh, when she said, well, this is these are the guys who made me want to make comics. Yes. So I was like, oh, well, this is your chance. How cool would that have been yeah. when we were kids? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to do something like that. So you guys are, are making a huge, huge impact in young people's lives. And for that, tip of the hat. So mm -hmm. AADL.org, Sharon Iverson, on Twitter. To, or No, you were on Facebook. Facebook, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm How very 2008 of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, quite. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw somebody post on Twitter today that saying you're not on Facebook is the, is the new I don't have a TV. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then we have David Carter, uh, the EECS librarian. What does EECS stand for? Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Okay, and the video game archivist. Right. What a great it's job a, title. It's a great cover, don't you think, that <laughs> title? <laughs> uh, and then uh, you work at the Art Architecture and Engineering Library at the University of Michigan. Dave reads comics on Twitter. And then also you have the Ignite Talk, and we've got the Mini Comics Day coming up on March 10th, and that's at lib.umich.edu slash minicomicsday. Correct. Yep. Looking forward to it. That looks, sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. So thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Jersey. This show will be back in two weeks at comicsaregreat.tv at 1230 p.m. Eastern Time. And, uh, and then it'll be collected as podcasts. This, this show will be available at, if, if you download this through Podcatcher, uh, comicsaregreat.com slash CAG46. Until next time, everybody, I've been Jersey Drozd of comicsaregreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.